the way you got to do, man. Go on, sir. I'm going to get you to walk. My hand up on the wall. It's my hand touching right now. Go to the side. Go to the side. What are you doing? What are you doing? All right. Hey, welcome. All right, welcome. Hey, resisting. You know what I'm saying? Hey, resisting. You know what I'm saying? Hey, welcome. Hey, welcome. Hey, welcome. Hey, welcome. Hey, welcome. Hey, welcome. Yeah. Diallo's mother cried out, why? Now the Larry Davis case shows you how the drugs were getting in, into the community. It was through the police, right? And the police drink, bring the drugs into the community. People get hooked on the, on the crack, the cocaine. It's disruptive to the family. And when it gets so disruptive, people commit crimes. You've got prisons with a massive, you know, prison industrial complex that has come into being in the last 20 years to handle the incarceration of large numbers of black and Latino men. You know, this is why I say Larry rep is a metaphor for a genocidal war against black people in America. And they've used drugs as a pretext to just wipe out a generation of young black people. To wipe them out. And it's a sad, sad, sad thing. It's a sad thing. It's another form of slavery, if you ask me. The suspect is known to be armed with a shotgun, 45 automatic, 357 magnum, small caliber handgun, and an Uzi submachine gun. Larry Davis is described as black, 5 feet 8 and 165 pounds. He used to have a mustache, but he is now clean shaven with close cropped hair. When they shot the house up. No, but he ain't no, in here. He's not in here. First time I seen Larry was on the news, you know what I'm saying? Uh, every station, every channel, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 7 o'clock. He literally out overpowered that group of killer cops who were coming to kill him. I'd say he's a fairly expensive fugitive at this point, Ben. Worth catching. I'm in here because of what happened in the police case. And they don't like the fact that I exposed the, the, them the way I did. Beat us. Well, no, not only beat us that night, he just beat me. Beat I can't understand this guy's heart. Larry Davis kept it gangster, man. He was a known, a known kid in the community. As far as I can see, everybody knew him. Actually, you know, he was like any other average teenage kids. You know, he liked to play basketball. Larry had a thing for driving. He liked to fix cars. He liked to fix motorcycles. Well, I was uh, a church-going kid. You know, I, I, I stayed into hobbies. Like, uh, my best hobby, I used to work for a uh, uh, motorsport and um, build motorcycles. I used to build motorcycles and stuff like that, different kind of motorcycles for the company. Um, and I was young doing that. I had good jobs and, and I, I, I did what uh, young kids would do. He liked the music, he had his little studio, he was trying to put out his own record. So basically that's what we used to do. Rap was you know, getting hot at that time. So basically that's what me and Larry, that's what we was into at that time, was really on the music business tip. In my circles, I didn't come across a Larry, you know what I'm saying? But when I did meet him, I was like surprised to see that he was on a level as these other DJs. Larry played the piano, 
um, the, uh, the the organ, the keyboard. He was in. He he was too musical for me. Eventually, he taught me to structure up songs and stuff like that with bridges. You know what I'm saying with verses, choruses, um, intros, outro, etc. You know what I'm saying. Larry taught me all that. Back then, you you didn't have too many brothers like spending their money and into a record company. He knew a couple of people in the business. You know what I'm saying. Um, from Jimmy Douglas. You know what I'm saying. Um, Bill Underwood, who was working with his brother. Gene something, and he used to, I know he used to manage uh, New Edition cats, Teddy Riley and them. And he hooked up with this guy, and um, you know, he was sending them the contracts, and he was like, you know, like, y'all don't believe me, I got this contract, you better read this. He gave us the contract to read, and we like, oh, it's real. And he was like, yo, Sham, listen, the world is bigger than a block, B. You know what I'm saying? The business you trying to get in is music, this entertainment, you know what I'm saying? You got all types of people, and you can't carry that type of attitude because you'll never get nowhere. So we was all right. We got girls. We got all that. We didn't have nothing. We didn't need to do anything to boost our ego. But we, what we didn't understand was this. In 85, if I'm correct, 86, that's when crack first started coming crazy in the hood. These guys, man, started coming around the crib, you know, as far as I could tell. And they was coming around the crib like he was always he was always playing his music my grandmother used to have to tell the dude to turn it down they would call larry up and say yo we coming and larry would tell everybody yo y'all got the bounce i got the bounce he wouldn't tell us why y'all had the bounce and who could walk up crazy george solid sometimes big red used to walk up you know what i'm saying it was like four different cops you know what i'm saying then do a whole mind frame change you know what i'm saying like like he was just ready to just go to war with these cats you know but he wouldn't really let everybody know what was going on at the time. They used to walk straight in the house, ask no questions. Walk straight up to, right to Miss Davis' house, straight upstairs, straight to Larry Road. Sometimes don't even knock, just walk straight in. Like they had a warrant or something, you know what I'm saying? Joe had a method of recruiting people. He used to come around and shake down a lot of the young people in the area. And he would have all types of different pictures. And he would say, well, you know, as you see, we have pictures of you. And we know where you live at. You know, all we want you to do is, uh, you know, you can make a little money just coming and standing in line because, you know, we have a rapist walking around. It's called Operation Condor, and it's federally funded to the NYPD to give officers overtime to go into what they would term cleaning up drug-infested neighborhoods, mainly Washington Heights in the South Bronx. So if you get pulled into one of these details uptown, every night you have to make five arrests, and this way you get overtime. Police was coming through, and I'm not saying anybody talking about a few, a dirty few, you know what I'm saying? That will come through and tell you, boom, listen, you want to pump this. Now they're making small time arrests in the neighborhoods, giving kids in the neighborhood permanent records, arrest records, picking them up for maybe drinking a 40 ounce or smoking a joint. And they're going out and doing that five times a night, maybe four or five guys to a unit. Now if they don't make those arrests, they get bounced out of the unit as they're being deemed not productive. There was two types of officers. One type, if the right situation just happened to come around and they felt comfortable, they would rob and steal. There was other officers who would go out and hunt for opportunities to commit corrupt acts. While some have said police corruption is not a widespread problem, the Mullen Commission says police corruption is a serious problem confronting the city. Any kind of organized crime cannot go on in the United States without the cooperation of the police department. Police got from the point where they might have got a couple of dollars for not busting somebody, not doing this, not doing that, to where they can be making crazy money overnight off this crap thing. Dow talked about how he made as much as $8,000 a week by protecting and sometimes shaking down drug dealers. How he often showed up to work at the 75th Precinct in Brooklyn in a drunken stupor, and how he snorted cocaine while in his patrol car. I was using drugs heavily. On the job? Yes. The uniform? Yes. While well, you were on duty, you're saying? Yes. What kind of drugs are you talking about? Cocaine and alcohol. Were you trying to conceal your use of drugs and alcohol on the job? In the beginning, I did. What about later on? Well, I used to do it off the dashboard. Off the dashboard? Yeah. The dashboard of your RMP? Yeah. 
back then in the 80s, there was a lot of cops involved with that shit. The Dirty 30 is robbing niggas, taking niggas money, taking niggas guns, let niggas hustle again. Everybody was involved in this shit. And not only the police, district attorneys, and perhaps even judges, people on the bench, were involved in profiting from running drugs. You buy a judge. You buy many judges. You used to have a saying. You talk about a judge. You say he's in the pocket. What do you mean? He's in the pocket of those who gave him the job. He does what he's told to do. Lawyers, judges, the government, everybody was involved in the 80s, man. These niggas must be hitting light. And I knew there was no regular dudes, you know what I'm saying? I knew who it was. I basically knew, you know what I mean, Popo was hitting this nigga with all that top of the line shit. And I knew it was a big ball game. It wasn't easy for him to just slide out. Whatever they catch me, I give them my, whatever I made that day, if I made three, three or four hundred dollars, I gave them money up. They let me keep the drugs. When they find out I was down with Larry, they never fucked with me. Cause they know I had to pay Larry so they, Larry could pay him. You know what I'm saying? And I knew this shit was much serious than some regular hustling and shit. You know what I mean? Some Broadway going downtown. This wasn't that, you know what I mean? These niggas was hitting them with mountains, telling them, bring us something back. You know how many Larry Davises there are walking the streets of New York City who work with the police in bringing drugs into their neighborhoods? What turned out just to be business began to be blackmail. I, I tell you, the turning point was when um, he had uh, a, a girl I was pregnant by him. You know what I'm saying? This is a girl he cared about. When I lost my son, and you know, uh, uh, involving the woman I was involved with at that time, uh, it was time to pull away from that kind of, uh, you know, dealings in terms of the drug thing. I remember just sitting with him, and he was talking. He was saying, "Yo, you know what I heard?" I heard the reason why the baby died is cause, yo, it was on cocaine. He never even knew the girl was using drugs. He said, yo, Sham, you know what happened? I found out that homeboy, talking about one of the police, you know what I'm saying? Was the one supplying her with that. This is somebody that I, I was doing business with, Sham. I said, what? And I was like, yo, man. I, I, that's it, P. They killed my son. And that was like the turning point for him. Because he cared about the girl. But he really was enthusiastic. He was like excited because the girl was giving birth to his first child. It meant so much to him. And it just threw him off like, yo, that's it. I don't care, P. I'm out this game. What we gonna do with this music? Now when Crazy Joe and Solomon find out that Larry's trying to get out the game and go into his own little business, shit would buck wild. They started busting everybody, started taking everybody's shit, and I was like, yo, what's going on? I know it's the pressure was coming on, you know what I'm saying? With these high authorities and Larry, they was kind of getting upset now that he wasn't making it happen no more. Threats on your fam, you got threats on, you know what I'm saying, your peoples, you got, you know what I mean? You just don't, you know, you gotta remember, this is not like we adults. We 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. You know, we little kids now. And they was running up everywhere. Sisters, moms, old ladies, whoever. Niggas on the corner. Niggas affiliated. Niggas who, everybody. You know what I'm saying? They came to the house one day and made some threatening statements to the family. A number of the police officers, two of them in any event, went to see his mother on October 30th of 1986. You know where he is, that's your son. You know what you raised, you raised a dirty, dirty bastard. That's what you raised. They came in there threatening to do life. So when you see your son, you raised a bastard. And uh, we're gonna kill him, straight up. They just, they just told his mother that they was gonna kill her son. So he said, you tell him he gonna get a bullet right before his forehead. And he was pointing at my head then. Larry had too much on the cops. He had too much. Anybody that knew Larry and lived on the west side or was down with the clique knew that the cops didn't like Larry. They wanted to kill him. He said, you hear what I say? And he all off and just pushed me around on my shoulder. And it was on and popping. You can see why um, a lot of people was leaving, especially Larry being the, being the number one recruit. 
wanted to go into hiding. And when Larry quit, he quit with their money. That is the money of the police officers. Well, you know, that doesn't fly. Like I said, he was an excellent businessman. Like I said, he stabbed his, his own record label. He, he had studios throughout the Bronx and a few in Manhattan. So we, we wanted to do, you know, be on the music tip. So like I said, for us, like I said, the media talking about this happened and, and the cops are looking for Larry on this. No, no, the cops was, was looking for Larry way before that. And not because he did this or this allegation that, no, they wanted their money. And when he offered them resistance, that is when they decided to eliminate him. They couldn't have their money, they wanted him dead. It looked like some out of a movie, man. I mean, it was crazy. You had the, the SWAT trucks, you know what I'm saying? The, the, you know, with the dudes dressed in black, SWAT team. I said, don't shoot, don't shoot. My grandchildren, too many grandchildren. Then there was a cop in front of us with the big white light, and he had the gun pointing at us, telling us to go. Go upstairs. People calling on the fire escape. So I'm like, I'm looking at something. Yo! And I wake up my brother and none of my cousin and we run to the we run to the window and look and we run downstairs and tell my grandmother. I went out and they had the guns sticking straight up all over. Just guns. So in the hard hats all behind the cars, like they were, I don't know, like uh gangsters or something. Come out, come out with your hands up. I said, what's happening? He said, ain't you Miss David? I said, yes, I am. You look outside, they got the, the trucks pulling up with the big, the uh, high-intensity light flashing it on the house. They come in there and escort everybody out the house again. We got another call. This is like 12 o'clock at night. And no, that Friday before that, they just came in the house. So they throw me up against the fence. And I fell. I told them, I said, I'm sick. So I'm having chest pains. I said, I... I feel like I'm coming down with a heart attack. So he says, uh, oh, you'll be all right. It all began on a dark November night, the 19th, when a team of police officers assembled outside a Bronx tenement. They believe Larry Davis was harbored in the apartment of another sister, and they wanted him for questioning in the slang of four reputed drug dealers in late October. The same night the cops came, we was in the house, me and Sham, okay? Larry feared for his life. Larry asked me and Sham to stay, but, uh, I begged Sham to leave because Larry kept back telling us that the police kept harassing him. We seen the police circling and circling and kept harassing the man. But Larry just stood a distance and just stood there and kept saying that the police is trying to kill him. So next thing I get a phone call and it was somebody about a magazine talking on the phone. And I was trying to get off the phone because I was cooking. But they just kept going on. And to me, I'm like, what are you calling me like 7 or 8 o'clock anyway? I was trying, I'm, no, I'm noticing something strange already, because all of a sudden I have magazines people want to call me, and nobody never called me before. I felt they just was trying to tie up my line. So I says, well, well, you want us to enter the door? You got a warrant. He said, uh, there was no warrant. We'll knock on the door, and if he doesn't come out, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can bullshit our way in, or maybe talk him out. Somebody tapped my door, and I just said, come in. And I'm in a foyer in the hallway of my between my kitchen and going out the door. I was leaning on the washing machine on the phone. And as soon as I came, as soon as I said come in, it, they just bum rushed my house. When I walked into the lobby, I got like two steps into the lobby when the the apartment door opened, and I saw the detective. He did one of these. Freeze. They had guns right in my face, rifles, not guns, rifles. Like they were coming to kill somebody assassinate i see the money was on the table don't shoot the kids in the room don't shoot take the money i heard something going like a firecracker and i just dodged towards my kitchen because my kitchen was right there when he shot at me uh i had a nine millimeter on me. um i had it on my side i spent with the little girl and i hit the floor and i realized when i looked up at the ceiling i realized i was still there and that i wasn't out that I actually was still alive. And they apparently thought that he did get a bullseye shot between the eyes. 
But when I when that gun shot and that fire, that bullet came out that 12 gauge, it was right between my eyes and I can see it coming and I, as it came, I just pulled myself back with it. Cause it hit me here. I had my head like that and I could see it coming and I pulled myself back like that. And I hit the floor with a little girl in my head. They were in a big home and they got there and they were running when they got out of the car. And they literally ran in. And as they ran in, they were loading the shotguns and loading the rifles. I can hear the cops, one of the cops telling him, finish him, finish everybody here and let's get out of here. We had information that some of them were drunk, that afterwards the police surgeon could smell liquor on their breath. And an officer came in the kitchen, had me at gunpoint at my kitchen window. And as soon as he went to try to get back out, I just kept screaming out the windows, please, somebody call the police. She was screaming like crazy. The detective ran right in the apartment. There was no way to stop. He just took off. We had to go in. I fired one, hitting him with impact into the mouth, and then coming out the back of his neck, and he flew in the air into many of the other cops who was back behind him with weapons. So because he was between them and myself, they didn't begin just immediately shooting because he was there and many of them dropped their guns trying to catch him in the air. And when he opened up and fired and they panicked, they dropped seven weapons on the floor and they fled. When they told them caught him, they dropped their guns and they said, back out, back the hell out. He got one, get out, back out. They're yelling and screaming and you hear this. I mean, massive noise, yelling, screaming, cursing each other out on their way, pulling out. Get the hell out, get the hell out, back the hell out. Cursing, cursing, cursing. And the last cop that was in the kitchen with me, he peeked out to um, see what was going on. And that's the cop that got bla glazed in his head. I stick my head out and I could see the cops there and they began firing, trying to hit me in the head. And uh, they had machine guns too. They were spraying up. the whole wall, looked like Swiss cheese from the holes, they were just shooting, shooting, just shoot randomly. So I already had a visual perspective of where they were because I had already looked out. So then I grabbed the bedroll off the back of my sister's closet, which is right there in the hallway. And I said, I'm gonna use this as a decoy to, to make them think I'm running out there. So I threw it and they began chasing it, shooting it, the bedroll. And when they did that, I came out and I fired and I had hit one point blank blast in the face and I caught the other one on the floor because I already knew where they were. My house was so crowded that they could have ran into each other and shot each other. That's how crowded it was. And then there was more and they, 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 I can hear them yelling, get out, you just got him, get out, back out. Ah. You know, they were screaming and took a, there's blood all over the place, there's blood all over the place, back out, back out, screaming and cursing and everything. He wasn't afraid. He was, he was, he just started shooting. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see the man to get a shot at him. I just mm -hmm. kept firing to keep him away from me. And mm -hmm. I imagine that's what everybody else was doing, just to keep him back. He yeah. was a lot of gunfire. I seen more right at the door, so more started coming in. Then I bent down and looked from behind, looked out through the exit there between the living room and looked to see where they were. And I could see them in there ready to fire again. So I went into the bathroom, came in, and I knew where they were. And I started firing through the wall, and I knew exactly where they were, and I hit uh, another one in the mouth, caught it in the mouth, and uh, I can hear him say, he's coming through the wall, he's coming through the wall, get out, back out, back out. What's going on? Look, just take that and go down to the corner and make a right. As I caught those two through the bathroom, one was coming up through the, uh, uh, I caught them through the wall in the bathroom. One was coming up, trying to do some type of Scarface move on me. He was coming up, climbing into the window, and he had his gun in his hand. And as I seen him coming, sticking his head up in the window, I jumped on the toilet bowl, and I kicked him right out the window, and he, I can hear him screaming and yelling as he hit the floor. I wish the media would stop second guessing what happened in the apartment, what went wrong. This is a dangerous profession. Things go wrong. There's nothing you can do to stop it. The same procedure would have been used the following day to hit the same apartment. 
No one is to blame except for Larry Davis. All I was thinking is my baby's somewhere dead because I seen a, um, a baby blanket and it was full of blood. And I guess it was from one of the officers because all the children were fine. But once I seen the, the baby blanket with the blood, all I kept saying is my, one of my kids is gone. I began to yell to my sister, are you all right? Are you all right? She, and then I can hear her say, I'm Larry, I don't know where they at. I said, are you, are you in here? Because I knew they was out of the apartment. I knew that, but I wanted to make sure they weren't in the kitchen because the doors, when, the, when they open the apartment door, it, it blocks off the kitchen and do the door. So you wouldn't know who's in there and know whether or not they ran in there while I was in the bathroom. So I, I yelled, I said, Gina, you in here? Are you all right? She said, I'm all right, I'm all right. She said, uh, they, they, they not in here, but she was yelling and stirring. Larry, you not in here? Was, is the kids all right? I said, the kids are all right. I said, are you all right? She said, yes, yeah, she's all right. I said, Gene, don't, if they in there, let me know. Don't just come out of that room there and let them cause fire at me. She said, Larry, ain't nobody in here, ain't nobody. And I said, okay, when you come out, keep your hands down to your side and duck. So she came out and I said, run to me. She ran to me. I said, go ahead, don't cut the light on. Just go and get the kids and let's get out of here. Get to the door. So as I stick my head out, to look, slowly sticking my head out, he laid in there. I saw him there with a 12 gauge shotgun. And he's laying there with it. He fires. Boom. And I look and I could see the bullet. I could see it was just coming. There's 12 guys. I looked right down the barrel and he was standing like a little distance to the front door of the building, leaving the exit to the building. The exit out. And the bullet, I turned my head like that. And the bullet went right into my other sister's apartment door. Which saved his life. Because when it hit the lock of his sister's door, the lock went open. On another sister's apartment next door, sprung the lock so he could get around into her apartment, which opened on a courtyard where there were no police and where there were no bars on the windows. To this day, I still don't know how I did it, but I did it. Um, it was a distance, how good, from the window to some mountain cliff. This is a cliff outside the window over on the side. And this, and this guy had some vicious pit bulls in that private house that it was a private house on. And I tell you, man, that's what I say to this day, I say, Allah bless me because I jumped from that distance in midair and jumped at least, I would say about just straight, about 25 feet, probably more. So he jumped out into the courtyard, over the wall, and got away. Detectives in emergency service went to arrest someone on a warrant for homicide, and uh, when they went to the door, he opened fire with a machine gun. There is a list of all the six. 40-year-old Mary Buckley shot in the mouth. 55-year-old John Ridge treated and released last night. 42-year-old Donald O'Sullivan, who suffered a graze wound to the head. 46-year-old Thomas McCarran shot in the neck. The most seriously injured, 26-year-old John O'Hara, shot in the face and may lose the sight in his left eye. I went to a project building not too far away from there. And within no more than three, four minutes, it was at least about good 15,000 police cars. Well, now Davis is accused of trying to kill again. His target this time, six police officers. He gunned them down last night, jumped out a window in the South Bronx, and is on the run. Police is on a manhunt from Manhattan to the Bronx, looking for Larry Davis. Fuck the streets, so we had to close down spots, man, being honest. Coming down on the bus, 41 bus, and the whole Webster Avenue after Fordham Road was shut down. I'm looking off the private door roof, and I can see everything. So I said, I gotta go check and make sure they ain't kill my sisters. So what I did, I came before they could start getting, because they were trying to get people off the street. Get off the street, you know, get out of here and scare people off the street. So I went down and I just took the risk. I put on a coat. I went to a person's house in that building that I knew. I got a coat, some glasses. And I changed the hat. And I went down, went back to the apartment building. And right where they were bringing in the other cops and stuff went through to the front door of the hospital. I stood behind me a Koch, Benjamin Ward, to see, make sure that my sisters didn't came out of there alive. When I seen that, they came out, all right, then I slowly eased away and 
went into the dog. You stood behind the mayor and, and the police coming in. And the police, yeah. While they were looking all over the building, I'm right behind them. They ran into a hail of gunfire when they tried to arrest a man wanted for four murders. He gunned them all down and got away. He said, yo, turn to Channel 7 right now. Turn right now. A man who apparently has no qualms about killing. Police describe him as a walking arsenal, extremely violent. They believe he would kill for absolutely no reason at all. He is a prime suspect in the execution-style murders of four men last month. Police are using an old photograph and an artist sketch in their search for Davis. They're taking no chances. So I turn to Channel 7, Eyewitness News. It had a record label, everything just spinning around. R.T. Powell, HBO Records. <laughs> Larry Records produced. I said, like, oh shit, what happened? He said, you haven't heard? He said, no. He said, he, he got into a shootout with some police officer. The whole city is looking for him. Larry Davis would take the New York City Police Department on one of the largest manhunts in the history of New York State. Like everybody else in New York, Kunstler and I first came in contact with Larry Davis by watching television. Like everybody, we were glued to the television set, first with the details of the shootout, and then with the hunt for Larry Davis. It was astounding when I first heard about it, because it was like the Robin Hood of the ghetto. The obvious tension relaxed once police, after searching the house and the neighborhood, decided that Davis was nowhere to be found. New York City Police Department can break you down. You can ask just about any drug law that's up, that's locked up behind now, how they, how they broke up their crew and got this brother to snitch on you or whatever like that. This brother was out here on the street, 19 years old, just turned 19, I believe, handling this stuff by himself for two weeks straight. And of course, it was our fear that he was never going to survive to see the light of day, that the police, once they caught him, were going to kill him. I knew they were watching everybody, any and everybody. If you didn't even have nothing to do with the situation, if you just knocked on my door, you was going to be watched later on. I guess when the police came to my place, based on the label, they know that he was dealing with some type of music. So they wanted to find me to see if I can get in contact with him. Earlier today, police had blanketed the neighborhood around East 168th Street, where Davis, the night before, had shot six police officers. Police went door to door, questioning neighbors, anyone who might have seen Davis. They asked me, said, listen, can we bug your phone, tap your phone line? Um, they said, you know, uh, we can get a permit for this, uh, some type of, you know, whatever like that. I said, you know, go ahead, do what you want to do. I doubt very seriously the brother would call my house. And like I said, shortly after that, the brother called the house, right? I said, so, pick up the phone, and I said, uh, in my usual, yes. And, he's, and I said, who's this? He says, me. I said, who's me? He said, you know who this is. And I started laughing. I said, yo, man, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? And then he said, oh, man, shit just went crazy out here, man. I said, well, you know, tell me what's going on, man. Just tell me the whole thing. And he was telling me his point of view right then on the phone, right? And I said, yo, man, they said that you uh, had a shootout with the police, man. He said, yeah, man, they, you know, they tried to kill me. They came in uh, my sister's house and they tried to kill me. And they tried to kill my lord nieces and nephews and stuff like that. So I couldn't let that happen. And he said, I, I, he said, I wasn't trying to kill them. I was just shooting at them to get them, back them up out of the house. They were shooting at themselves. I knew about the wiretaps. I knew all, I, I knew everything there is to know about the police department. Don't say any more right now because they're right here in my house. He said, they're right there. I said, yeah. So he hung up. And when he hung up, the police officer at that moment, they turned on me. As much as they were watching me, when I did come back, I was watching them for three days. I can tell, tell you every move they made, when they were following one person, I'm right behind them. I knew they, they, I knew they games. I knew how they played the game. Why the fuck you told them to get off the phone? Why the fuck you did this? I said, because well, this shit don't sound right. You telling me this brother right here, um, Larry, it's a crazed brother right here. I said, this brother don't sound crazy. This brother sound like he's scared. What the fuck is going on here? What You tell me what's going on here right now. The big question, however, today, with so much police firepower in position last night, how did Davis manage to escape? Well, we have to, in a sense, tiptoe because we don't want to hurt someone else. And he doesn't care about who he hurts. 
Then we're at a distinct disadvantage. Six officers shot by the same man. That raises serious questions about procedure. Did the officers trying to arrest Davis go by the book? And were proper procedures followed after the shootout? So somebody called in and made a report that they believe I went in the building. They weren't even sure. You know, they said little guy, short guy, husky guy, he went in the building. And I'm not sure it's him, but let's check and find out. And so when they was checking the building out, uh, I was on the second floor. Um, I then ran to the 14th floor to this woman's house who I didn't even know. But she attended the church of my brother, my mother's brother's church. I didn't even know that. And as we were sitting in the apartment, I knocked on the door. I seen one woman who came out the apartment. I said, Miss, I said, uh, you see all the cops out to the side of the building? She said, yeah, that's why I was leaving my friend's house to go downstairs. I said, yeah, because I was standing by the elevator. I said, well, uh, she said, I heard they was on the news that they're looking for Larry Davis. <laughs> and she didn't know who I was. So she said, that's what they're saying. So I said, uh, well, I said, that's me. She said, for real? <laughs> this is like disturbing. <laughs> for real? Are you serious? I said, yeah. I said, what I need to do right now, I need to get in safe haven for an apartment here. Just to be easy for a few few minutes, a few hours or something until we clear out. I can get out of this building. 20-year-old Larry Davis is still on the loose. The prime suspect in as many as seven murders and the wounding of six New York City cops. I went in the apartment. She didn't even know me. I went in the apartment. And I explained the situation. And uh, she was a very religious woman. She had some beautiful little children, uh, playing with her children. And uh, as we sat there, hoping these guys clear out, you know, I'm hoping these guys clear out, uh, me and her began to talk. And, and, and then we find out that she went, she goes to my mother's brother's church, and she knew the neighbor's buddies. Her husband came home. He was so scared. I mean, I ain't never seen it in my life. He's up there, Lord Jesus, please, please, please. This is the way he was talking. Please, they gonna kill us all. Oh God, I'm like, calm down, brother. You gonna be all right? Trust me on this, you gonna be all right. Just calm down. There's reports on the latest police moves to find their man. The city's most wanted fugitive is still Larry Davis. For a week, police have been combing the city and conducting searches like this one of Davis's family's house. Today, the police department has nothing official to say about the search, because such efforts are always conducted amidst tight security. I came up with a plan that I learned a long time ago with dealing with the cops. So I said, listen, I told her husband, I said, listen, the kids ain't eat a big meal, man. Go get the kids something to eat. I'll give you money. I gave him the money. I said, but this is what I need you to do at the same time get the kids a meal. The Chinese store downstairs. I said, I want you to go call this number, which was my mother's house. I said, it's wiretap. I said, do not stay on the phone no more than one minute, less than that, and, and even less than that. Just get this message across. I said, if you stay on there anything past five minutes, they tap, tap the phone and they'll know right where you at. So I said, once you call that number, this is what you say. I said, what you say, this is Larry. Ma, I'm all right. Don't worry about me. Blah, blah, blah. I got out of the building and just no more, I said, stay on there one minute, because they're going to zero right in on that phone and try to tap it and see where you at. On his way back, he was got in the elevator, and one of the cops said, he said, I don't care who, he was in the elevator, the cops heading up back to the park. And the cop said, I don't care who got him in this house, I'm killing everybody. Anybody who holding him and hiding him in this house is talking about me, I'm killing everybody. So this guy's in the elevator, he already not, uh, knee knocking, so he's scared to death. And, 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 uh, so first thing he thinks is cops going in there to kill his family. So then he goes, and he said, listen, I would like to speak to your superior officer. I said, for what? Because you talking about killing people's families and stuff of this nature, I would like to speak to him because you, you, you know, that, that's not the way he's supposed to be talking. I, I would like, I, I, think I, I, know, I think I know where Larry Davis at, and they came out with it. Then they brought him to some superior officer, then told him where I was. If he really sincerely wants to give himself up, he, no cop is going to hurt him. No cop is going to touch him. When we took the person who killed uh, the 10 people in Brooklyn, nobody touches these people. I was not coming up out of there the new NYPD, because I know how vicious they are. 
you know, and I was not just going to walk in the hands of NYPD, no way. I knew exactly how to get down. For Larry Davis to do that incredibly brave, incredibly audacious act, say, I'm not going to be a victim, you're not going to go to church and cry over my body, because I'm going to make sure that I walk out of this. It was just, it was phenomenal. So I said, I, I, I'd rather go out fight this battle with them and then just walk in their hands because they'll try to kill you no matter what and just lay the gun right to my side. Um, I told him I want the FBI then. I want to talk to the FBI. And I explained it to the FBI, everything that was happening. And uh, they, they told me, listen, we, you know, we'll, we'll uh, go over this and uh, we, we'll, we'll work with you, get you out of the situation. And then to, you know, just come on out of there, lad. I'm going to pass my, I'm not going to have no gun on me. I'm going to pass my badges under the door. You know we really FBI. And I told him, uh, nobody is to have guns on them. I said, I'm going to come out. I said, if y'all pull a gun out, you're going to make me get itchy finger and I have to do what I got to do. You got to do me or I'm going to do y'all. And I said, don't hurt me. I'm not going to hurt you. You know, and then they, I, I came out the door, took off my shirt. I said, I'm going to take off my shirt to make it clear that I don't have no weapon on me. And I'm going to turn slowly and everything. And I said, she'll be on the phone and she'll verify I put the weapon down. And I put the weapon down. And she's like, yeah, he put the weapon down. I got the weapon over here. And uh, she was on the phone telling him. And then the two FBI agents, they were outside the department, standing by, behind a bulletproof shield. After 17 days on the run, Larry Davis would eventually turn himself in, in the full light of the media, and return for his safety. The detective ran right in the apartment. There was no way to stop. He just took off. We had to go in. I think he should be shot by all those nine cops, because um, this city's going, it's going to hell. He actually engineered his own surrender in the full light of the press. He knew that the media was there, that uh, what would happen is that the police would not be able to vent their anger. So we were very surprised and certainly very pleased to find out that he had survived his ordeal with the police. And I think we got the call shortly after he was taken into custody. Originally, Stanley Cohn was representing him. Uh, Stanley at that time was working for the Legal Aid Society. And Kunstler, who was the best known civil rights lawyer in America at that time, uh, got the call. And we met Larry shortly after that. As soon as I, I heard about the case, uh, Bill was sketchy about it. I think Mrs. Davis had gone to see Bill. And uh, when I listened, I said, this is the most important case that you people are ever going to see. And so Lynn says, well, get out to Rikers Island and talk to Larry. The historical position of Larry's cases, when we first came into the picture, Larry had five cases. He had the murder of five drug dealers at their spot in, on Southern Boulevard in the Bronx. That was the first case against him. The second case against him was the shooting of the attempted murder of six policemen. Uh, the third case against him was a shooting in Upper Manhattan uh, in the apartments uh, by the George Washington Bridge there. The fourth case against him was a shooting through a doorway where nobody actually saw who did the shooting, but the person believed it to be Larry. And the fifth was a kidnapping case, which came from when he was on the run, and he apparently commandeered a friend's father to drive him from one place to another. Well, of course, the kidnapping case was the least important, and they actually were tried in the order in which the prosecution, the DAs, thought they could get convictions. The most difficult thing about the case at the beginning was making sure that Larry lived until the time that he stood trial. He was the subject of numerous attacks while he was being held in pretrial confinement. What are you doing? I'll show you. What are you doing? All right. Hey, welcome. Hey, what's going on? 
Finally, Kunstler filed a successful motion to have him transferred into federal custody because the hostility of the police toward him was so great, there was a very real fear that he would be murdered, lynched in essence, before he ever stood trial. Larry was held initially at Rikers, then he was moved to the Bronx house to be closed for trial. Um, we came to court one day, Bill and I, and Larry said, we can't go forward. I was attacked last night, I got all stabbed up in my back, I think it was. He said, look, here are the marks, here's the shirt. You know, and this guy that did it, I, he wasn't even supposed to be there. Would he now bring charges against the police? I am going to bring charges. As long as I can get them, it's, me and my lawyers are seeking to get your press charges against them for trying to murder me. I tell you, the moment when I came into court to give my summation in the cop case, um, when I walked in there and I saw lined up in the front row all the cops that had been wounded, all the cops that had been on the raid, all showed up in uniform for the summation. In other words, to sit there and eyeball that jury as if to say, we are reminding you that what this man did. There was, um, I don't remember, Mary, whatever her name, whose whole face had been blown off even though she received plastic surgery, but there were all of them lined up in the front row. They announced their purpose and he began firing at the police. The police returned their fire and well, the blue line is basically a concept that, that has to do with the loyalty and fealty that one cop has for the other, and that no matter how heinous the crime a brother officer may commit, the other officers are going to be silent about it or are going to cover it up. Our self-defense of Larry in the department, in the apartment, hinged on the fact that a, the first policeman that rushed in there saw him at the end of the hall rushed down and shot him with a shotgun. When I walked into the lobby, I got like two steps into the lobby when the, the apartment door opened and I saw the detective. He did one of these, freeze or whatever. He started yelling and I heard a woman start screaming. She was screaming like crazy. The detective ran right in the apartment. There was no way to stop. He just took off. We had to go in. We had proof that there was a bullet found in the back apartment that had gone through a drawer. Uh, he fired the 12 gauge. It grazed me here, as I would indicate here again. It grazed me here on the top of my head. But how do you prove that that was the first shot? How did you prove that this was? And we hadn't been able to get any cops to say that anybody was carrying a shotgun in the initial group that rushed the apartment. They all said, oh no, they had handguns, oh no, they were the only emergency service had shotguns. Nobody had a shotgun, nobody had a shotgun. It had gone, skimmed Larry's head, stuck in a desk, and it had two holes. And I remember the day that with lasers, we checked out the trajectory, and Lynn Stewart looked at that, and she looked at it, and she looked at it, and then she says, now we know why it was self-defense. Ralph went and Peter DeForest, who later played a very great role in this case, went also to the apartment. And Peter DeForest is the head of uh, forensic sciences at John Jay College now. If that gun had been fired from so many feet back, it would have to be fired in the air, following the trajectory of the bullet. And she walked it down to a place where it could be held in a man's hand. And he says, and this is where he was when he fired it. He was down the hallway, in the bedroom, and it was a sure shot because Larry wasn't more than four or five feet from him. And he fired, and it creased Larry's head and took him down, and then he backed off and everybody let it go. And as Lynn Stewart pointed out, nobody runs down the hall to a man within four or five feet of a man who's firing at you. 
Larry hadn't fired a shot when that slug creased his head and took him down. And that is, of course, what truly won the case. That and the ability of a Bronx jury to hear the truth and not run away from it. The verdict was a stunning legal upset. Not guilty 16 times. Not guilty of murdering four reputed drug dealers. Not guilty of robbery. You say you find the friend of Larry Davis. Say you find the friend of Larry Davis not guilty of all counts submitted to you, and so say you all. Prosecutors who wouldn't comment tonight called more than four dozen witnesses in their failed effort. The defense said it was a police frame-up. But even flamboyant defense lawyer William Kunstler admitted when deliberations started that he was hoping just for a hung jury. They won this one, they would never have brought it, but they lost this one, they have no choice, they'll have to bring that case. And if you got just that face, God will just take you through it. So do you think you're going to see your son at home then in the near future? I believe that. All right. I believe it. The jury found Davis innocent last month of all but the weapons charges for which he was sentenced today. The police were stunned. 2,000 of them demonstrated outside the Bronx courthouse calling for a maximum 10 to 20 year sentence. Judge Freed stopped short of that though, handing down a 5 to 15 year term. After the sentencing today, other officers who shot it out with Davis in 86 reacted. He, he beat us. He not only beat us that night, he just keeps beating it. I can't understand this guy's life. He was acquitted of all the attempted murders and assaults and everything else. He was convicted of possession of the firearms. But he also faces trial for two unrelated murder cases and kidnap and assault charges as well. Still, for the police officers who faced Larry Davis's guns, it is not enough. The tragedy of the Larry Davis case is as innocent as he was, they had enough cases and enough time, they were determined to put him away. And if they hadn't succeeded on the one they succeeded on, they would have succeeded on the next one, or the one after that, or the one after that. There was no way on earth that this system was going to let him go. Right after I get acquitted of, of the shooting the cop case, then they put an old police jury who related to cops in one way or other. In fact, you had some people who were uh, uh, one who was a law enforcement officer sitting on my jury. This is what was what I had, and there was no way around it. The judge forced these people to remain there, and, and some of them who wanted to get off the case because they couldn't be fair because they were had relatives who was cops. Throughout this long month, this case. There has been a third prosecutor, or rather persecutor. <clears throat> that persecutor is the so-called judge here today. Throughout this case, Davis has painted himself as a victim of corrupt police officers. He says he was a drug enforcer for rogue cops. He says he shot his way out of his sister's apartment only in self-defense. He even brought character witnesses to court today to tell the judge about his recent religious conversion to Islam. This case around the drug dealer being killed the drug dealers who were a part of the, a drug ring set up by the cops. These drug dealers refused to get, turn over money to the cops. Cops sent other drug dealers to kill this, these, this individual. Uh, the ones who killed him, uh, the person, the, 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 the drug dealer's wife who was in the apartment that day, she witnessed the actual person who killed him. This woman who was there in the building the night of the murder, gets on the stand and says, blurts out, in fact, because the judge and the prosecutor were doing, was, they were doing everything that they could to prevent this lady from saying this. But she said, she blurted out on the witness stand, uh, I don't want, something to the effect of, I don't want to send an innocent man to jail. Now, during trial, we had requested this witness come forward and the district attorney had control over this witness. They refused to uh, give us the accurate information so we can interview this witness. Now, I spoke to her after she came off the witness stand. I spoke to her in the, in, in, in the, in the courtroom. She told me that she was a good friend of the murder victim's wife, or Ms. Torres. I think her name is Maria Torres. Um, and she said that Ms. Torres told her that those three men, I think one, the last name is Matos Gall, 
And there's another guy named Tiki. She said his arm was cut off. They were Spanish. Uh, she said that they were responsible for the murder and not Larry Davis and his brother Eddie. We brought in her neighbor, who was her and her best friend, and she told her who did it. And it was the district attorney's witnesses, two witnesses who were drug users and drug dealers. Might I add, these guys, the day of the actual killing, they went to the precinct and they picked out two persons, not me or not my brother. I covered this in detail. I gave names, you know, full names, addresses, you know, direct quotes, testimony from that trial. And I guarantee that if you go back and look at the Daily News stories, the New York Times stories, the Post stories about that coverage of that particular trial, you won't see anything in there about that testimony. There's a perspective that says the police department is always right. The white sign is always right. And if he's a black man, he must have been wrong. One of the biggest frustrations that I had as an editor, as a reporter during that four-year tenure was coming to the realization that the mainstream white press in this city, and, in, and not only in this city, but across the country, is very, very much involved of what police will say and what newspapers will write about what police say regarding blacks. They don't tell the whole truth. They don't tell uh, what people need to know so they can make intelligent and informed decisions about a particular case. The media had a campaign to slander him to make it look like he was a, some kind of a uh, urban terrorist. And they don't like the fact that I exposed the, the, them the way I did. They don't like that. that you know, so, and, and they want to make the public believe that I was guilty of something to justify their actions. You can send me to no man's land and lock my temple away for life. But the spirit that I possessed on November of 1986 live for life. It's been 16 years in this prison and Halal has kept me strong. Though time to time my body gets weak, my mind stays strong. I have come to see that I am the master of my destiny and Allah is the only one who could set me free. Do you see yourself as a role model for black kids? Well, I, I'm not trying to teach no black kids to, to go around shooting police. I'm not trying to teach them nothing like that. That's, that's not the case here. The case is self-defense. <laughs>